really happy that I am given an opportunity to talk on a topic that is prevention of cardiovascular disease in diabetes. There is something happy about this event. Two specialities have come together, crossing the borders, that is diabetes and cardiology. It has become cardiodiabetology. The European Society of Cardiology and the European Association for the Study of Diabetes have joined together, formulating guidelines for therapy. Way back in January 1922, Leonard Thompson became the first patient to have received insulin in Toronto. 85 years later, what is the scenario of diabetes? As put forward by the World Diabetes Foundation, every 10 seconds a patient with diabetes is dying. And in another 10 seconds, in every 10 seconds, two patients are newly diagnosed to have diabetes. And during the course of the presentations, we have been listening to the prevalence of diabetes globally. In India, at present we have 41 plus million patients with diabetes and probably twice having pre-diabetes and globally diabetes is increasing especially in the developing world and this is one article which appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine recently. The epicenter of the diabetic quake lies in the metabolic syndrome. It's called the cardiometabolic syndrome. And what exactly is cardiometabolic syndrome? Last evening, I was delivering a talk at Paravur, and one doctor <coughs> would like to know the details of the metabolic syndrome. So I thought that I will include a slide which is useful to both the doctors and to the patients. We have a definition from the International Diabetes Federation for the Asian Indian population. And the Definition of metabolic syndrome is different for different ethnic groups. You should have central obesity plus any two of the following. And for Asian Indians, a central obesity is defined as a waist circumference equal to or more than 90 in men and more than 80 in women. Plus any two of the following four factors, triglycerides more than 150, HDL less than 140 in males and less than 50 in females, a blood pressure 130 over 85. And in all these situations, if the patient is already on treatment for hyperlipidemia or for blood pressure, then they should be regarded as having this factor. And a fasting plasma glucose of equal to or more than 100. And in some of the Indian studies, they have used the criteria of more than 110 milligrams. What is the revolution in the understanding of diabetes? Previously, diabetes used to be a glucose-centric disease. And nowadays, diabetes is known as an inflammatory cardiovascular illness. And we have three major targets to aim at. The hemoglobin A1c, which is the average of blood glucose over the past three months. And second one is the blood pressure. And the third one is the cholesterol, which should be less than 200 milligram percentage. And these are the three major targets in diabetes which should be aimed at in the prevention of cardiovascular complications. And in our own studies with our population, in our diet screening Kerala population, we have observed in Kerala that compared to the blood glucose or with the blood pressure, the cholesterol values in our population, in our normal subjects, are very, very high. And if you look at the glycated hemoglobin values, even 1% reduction from say 7 to 6 will help in the prevention of microvascular complications by 37% and even the risk of MI reduced by 14%. But unfortunately, when we are dealing with all these criteria, we have three levels of care as put forward by the International Diabetic Federation. The reason being, the resources available in different countries are not the same, helping us to achieve the so-called A, B and C targets. 
and we have three levels of care and I have given three pictures for a comparison. The minimal care, the standard care and the comprehensive care. In the minimal care, we have very limited resources like in countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And in standard care, we should be aiming at home blood glucose monitoring. We should be aiming at administering statins based on the cholesterol levels. We should be administering one, two or three medications for reducing the blood pressure because blood pressure medications are more important in the treatment of diabetes. And only in the so-called comprehensive care, we should be looking for the continuous glucose monitoring, insulin pumps, etc., etc. But even in the so-called minimal care, it is set in the guideline that if statins are available free of cost, then it is quite justifiable to administer statins to diabetes patients irrespective of the fact that cholesterol cannot be measured if laboratory facilities are not available. And recently in diabetes care in August, there is a guideline on statins use in public health. Statins should be routinely prescribed to all men and women with diabetes over 40 and 45 years old respectively for primary cardiovascular disease prevention in diabetes. And this strategy is recommended to prevent cardiovascular events from a public health perspective. And recently in the ADA at Chicago, uh, there, there was a presentation on diabetes as a risk equivalent uh, of coronary artery disease as depicted in this diagram. Compared to those subjects without a heart disease, there is a substantial increase in heart attacks in the diabetes population. And here is another study where we have this green bus with no diabetes and subjects with diabetes depicted as red bars. And these are the risk factors. One risk factor, two risk factors and three risk factors. The risk factors in study being serum cholesterol, smoking and systolic blood pressure more than 120 milligram. And if you look at this subject or this study population with one risk factor alone with diabetes, the risk of having a coronary vascular event is much higher than a population, a comparable population without diabetes having all the three risk factors. That is the importance of preventing cardiovascular complications in diabetes. Looking at some of the therapeutic strategies that we are following in our practice, sulfuria as the time-tested drugs, are they safe? This is an ongoing controversy since several years. And there are studies to support that the older generation sulfurias block the potassium ATP channels and could prevent the so-called ischemic preconditioning, predisposing to heart attacks. And the earlier sulfurias binds to 140 kilodalton molecule attached to the potassium channel, whereas the newer ones like the glimepiride are much safer so that the closure of the potassium channel is not that strong enough. And subsequently, there is opening up of the calcium channel and insulin is released via exocytosis. And because of this safety offered by glimepiride, glimepiride is probably better than glimeclamide because of its lower affinity for the mitochondrial K ATP channels. And if you look at the commonly used TCDs, uh, we call it the glitazone, spioglitazone and rosiglitazone. They have the additional benefit of bringing down the inflammatory markers like the TNF alpha resistant. It increases the levels of the hormone from the adipose tissue, that is the adiponectin, reduces the PI1 levels, reduces the free fatty acids. So they offer additional advantages when compared to the other groups of oral drugs. And TCD is because of its insulin sensitizing action. Probably they are 10 to 20 times stronger when compared to metformin as sensitizers. They are recommended for yearly use in diabetes population. And when you compare the two glitazones, PIO is probably having an additional advantage of bringing down the LDL and increasing the STL when compared to rosiglitazone. What about adding insulin early in diabetes therapy? Nowadays, you have been listening to several lectures on early insulin initiation in diabetes. What is the reason for that? And uh, 
uh, our tiny eyes are, would also recommend uh, introducing insulin in situations where there is a myocardial infarction or history of heart disease. The reason being, there are pleiotropic effects of insulin. Other than for reducing the blood sugar, it reduces the hypertriglyceridemia, it reduces the inflammatory markers, improves myocardial metabolism under stress, etc., etc. And a word about the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is very commonly seen in diabetes subjects and its association with cardiovascular disease among type 2 diabetes subjects. This study is published in the February issue of Diabetes Care. And if you look through the journals, we have several new articles coming up with the occurrence of steatosis, the hepatic steatosis, elevated OTPT values, and association of diabetes with heart diseases. And what about the glycemic control and coronary heart disease risk? If you, if you consider the glycated hemoglobin value as one of the investigations to be done in diabetic population you are on, this investigation can be done as part of an executive checkup. The reason being, even in the non-diabetic population, the chances of a heart disease increases once the A1C value or the glycated hemoglobin value is more than 4.6, there is a substantial increase uh, over 20 percentage. And if you monitor the blood glucose values in an uncontrolled diabetes patient, you might see that every 5 or 10 seconds, the glucose values fluctuate from 85 to 221 to 92 to 139. It goes on fluctuating. And this phenomenon is called acute glucose excursions. And this acute glucose excursions when compared to a chronic sustained hyperglycemia activates oxidative stress. And there are a couple of articles dealing with acute glucose fluctuations and glycemic variability. And this is the recording from one of our patients who underwent the continuous glucose monitoring system that we are using in our hospital where the blood glucose is measured continuously over 24 hours, continuously over 3 to 7 days, and each color denotes a particular day. And this is how the blood glucose fluctuates so that we can decide on the treatment. The reason being, the fluctuations of blood glucose resulting in oxidative stress due to hyperglycemia and glycoxidation leads to increased production of F2 isoproteins, SISO PGF2 alpha which leads on to increase in platelet activation reflected by an increased urinary secretion of platelet-derived thromboxane B2, resulting in increased levels of PI-1 levels. There is something different in diabetes and the markers in diabetes. The, this is an uh, article published by Peter Libby and Brodsky in Circulation 2002, and they have been dealing with uh, other factors which could be independent from the risk factors present in normal subjects. Diabetes patients being different in having hyperglycemia, glycated protein, advanced glycation end products, deposition of those products onto the vessel wall, presence of increased free fatty acids which are again unique to the diabetic population, lipemia, etc. etc. Probably we are missing something which could be markers which will help doctors like us to assess the cardiovascular risk factors in a diabetic population versus a non-diabetic population. Should minimal blood glucose variability become the gold standard of glycemic control as evidenced by the DCCT? The answer is yes. There is something much more than a glycated hemoglobin that we should be controlling. But when we are treating diabetes, the main limiting factor is hypoglycemia. And recently we presented in the American Diabetic Association a study on achieving A1C below 6 via a diabetes tele-management system-based tele-follow, aiming at fasting below 100 and each two of postprandial glucose values after breakfast, lunch and dinner below 135 mg percentage through a telemedicine follow-up program. And our patients using this DTMS follow-up program Majority of them are achieving an A1C below 6 at 3 to 4 months period. And another method of treating the glycine fluctuations are 
glucose excursions is with the use of insulin pumps as seen in this tiny video. And these are the newer generation pumps that we are using, which has got a transmitter in addition to the usual insulin pump. And this is the new generation pumps that we are using, which will have insulin incorporated into the pump as usual, the earlier generation pumps. But in addition to this, there is something called a mini link transmitter. Here there is a biosensor needle and this functions like a glucometer which will transmit the glucose values wireless by a radio frequency mechanism and every five minutes the glucose is displayed over the pump. And if there is a chance of glucose coming down or glucose value going up, arrows will appear over the pump pointing downwards or pointing upwards and it will give out an alarm. What is pre-diabetes? The importance of pre-diabetes is in the occurrence of heart diseases. Pre-diabetes in Asian Indians can be defined as a fasting more than 110 and less than 126 and a 2 hour value more than 140 and less than 200 milligram percentage. And we have several studies to support the importance of pre-diabetes and the early management of dysglycemia. Approximately 472 million adults worldwide will have pre-diabetes by 2025. And the importance of pre-diabetes is that approximately 50% of individuals, half of those with pre-diabetes, will eventually develop diabetes. And much more important than that is, individuals with pre-diabetes are 34% more likely to die from cardiovascular diseases than healthy individuals. And that is the importance of detecting, evaluating pre-diabetes and preventing the progression of pre-diabetes to diabetes and to cardiovascular diseases. And this is an Asian study of dysglycemia seen in uh, ICU setting and in the population with coronary artery disease. And this color denotes normal glucose tolerance and this is pre-diabetes and this is newly diagnosed diabetes. Approximately two-thirds of subjects had hyperglycemia and three-fourths of patients have hyperglycemia in the whole population. And what are the pharmacological interventions to prevent coronary heart disease? Obviously, they are the lifestyle modifications and then uh, the diabetologists advocate the use of aspirin in subjects over the age of 40 years with additional risk factors. Antihypertensive therapy, one, two, three or four medications aiming at a target below 130 by 80 or 85 millimeters of mercury. And lipid lowering therapy, already I have mentioned it. And aspirin, small dose aspirin. And there is a concept of a polypill gradually emerging. And I saw something over here, polytor, I don't think it is there available in the Indian market. And so many are working on this polypill and probably we will have this polypill with a combination of an ACI or a statin aspirin together. And there was an editorial in JAPI on introducing the polypill in India. And since it is a cardio diabetes CME, I thought we, I should be uh, including a couple of slides on the recent Rossi Glitterson controversy. Uh, this one is familiar to the entire crowd. It's all started uh, on May 21st, 2007 when Stephen Nissen, the head of the Department of Cardiology at Cleveland Clinic, along with his uh, statistician Kathy Wolski published an article, a meta-analysis of several other trials, denoting that Rossi glitazone increases the risk of myocardial infarction by more than 40 percentage. And we doctors were all confused and later FDA met and there was a uh, verdict from FDA on July 30, 2007 that there should be a black box warning on both pioglitazone on ro and rosiglitazone on the risk of heart attacks, not heart attacks but cardiac failure but rosiglitazone will remain in the market and we were prescribing rosiglitazone with caution but again a couple of days back September 12, 2007 Two articles appeared in Journal of American Medical Association on pioglitazone and risk of cardiovascular events, denoting that 
Pyre Lidhasan is associated with a significant lower risk of death. Though they belong to the same class, uh, they have analyzed several trials, 19 trials, and came to a conclusion that Pyo is probably safe when compared to Rosiglitazone and doesn't have any significant risk of heart attacks, but only heart failure. But adding fresh fuel onto the Rossi controversy, this is an independent trial, not from US, but from UK. And this concluded that Rosiglitazone use either for the prevention of diabetes or the treatment of diabetes over a period of one year is associated with 42 or 43 percentage increased risk of MI and heart failure. So now doctors, all doctors are totally confused. And with that, I would like to conclude, low A1C and normal sugars are not unachievable dreams, but they are achievable goals. And all physicians should be aiming at three targets for the prevention of cardiovascular diseases and diabetes, a normal glycated hemoglobin level, a low blood pressure, a very low cholesterol in high risk individuals and LDL below 70 mg. And polypharmacy is indispensable for sustaining the targets of therapy. And this is the past and this is the present. Thank you very much for the patient listening.